I'm impressed. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sally Keller. I'm the provost here at this wonderful institution. And on behalf of the president and vice chancellor, Faridun Hamdalopper, myself and our entire institution, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 41st Hagee Lecture. Tonight, we're carrying forward an important tradition at the University of Waterloo. The Hagee Lectures are facilitated in the memory of our founding president, Dr. Joseph Gerald Hagee. And it's under joint sponsorship of the university and the University of Waterloo Faculty Association. I want to thank the association for their continued support for this important series. It's vital as an academic institution that we come together around big ideas, like the ideas that our distinguished lecture is well known for. Just as our 2012 Hagee Lecture has worked tire tirelessly to understand some of the deepest governance and economic challenges currently imposed on our globalized world, so does the University of Waterloo seek to understand and help resolve the great public challenges of our time. Since our founding in 1957, our institution has thrived on the commitment of societal relevance. Our connection to industry and our focus on research areas that impact daily life show in a very real way that our commitment to societal innovation and success is true and absolute. For that reason, I hope and trust our distinguished guests feels right at home here at University of Waterloo. Ladies and gentlemen, to properly introduce our speaker, let me welcome to the podium Dr. John Melka. He's one of our professors in the School of Public Health and Health Systems and is chair of the lecture committee. John. Well, good evening, everyone. And please allow me to begin by echoing Professor Keller's remarks. Welcome to the University of Waterloo. Now, before we introduce our guest, uh, I would like to take a moment or two to expand on the introduction to the lecture series itself. So the series was created in 1970 to honor the contributions of Dr. Gerald Hagee, uh, who helped, uh, as you heard a moment ago, to establish the University of Waterloo, and who served for more than a decade as its first president. Now at the time, the stated goal of the lectures, which have remained jointly sponsored by the university and the faculty association, was to bring to our campus individuals who had made substantial contributions to scholarly or creative endeavors. As well, the hope was that each year's speaker would present not only engaging ideas, but ideas that would help to show our community how different fields of inquiry might be drawn together. Now, the first lecture was delivered in January of 1971 by Professor George Wald. And for those of you who might be interested, uh, Professor Wald was the recipient of the 1967 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his research into the biological processes of vision. And all of the speakers since Professor Wald have more than accomplished the initial goals of the series, and in so doing, have made instrumental contributions to public discussion within our community. Now, in addition to Professor Wald, we have been quite fortunate to welcome other Nobel laureates, such as Gerhard Hertzberg and John Polanyi, public intellectuals, such as John Ralston Saul and Michael Ignatieff, and influential artists, such as Adam Agoyan and Margaret Atwood. Now, to this wonderful and distinguished list, I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming our 41st invited guest, Professor Paul Collier, who will be very kindly introduced by my colleague, Professor Sue Horton. Thank you. So you can tell it's an extremely distinguished guest when it needs three of us to do the initial introduction. And Paul is also incredibly distinguished by having his biography on Wikipedia, uh, which is, I guess, these days even better than being in Who's Who. Um, although it does say in Wikipedia, note, this is not Paul Collier, the snooker referee. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask Paul if that's a, anyone that he knows or has been mistaken for. He is uh, an extremely distinguished, if you cho choose to go to his uh, biography on Wikipedia, 
Uh, he was born in Sheffield in the UK, about which I will mention a little bit more later. Um, and having studied at Oxford um, and completed his PhD, uh, he has stayed on at Oxford as um, a fellow of St. Anthony's College and a long-standing, he's been the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies. Uh, and yeah, in addition to all uh, his very distinguished academic career and his uh, research on uh, development economics and in particular on Africa, um, he has also been drawn on for his expertise in many practical areas. So he has been an advisor to the strategy department of the IMF, to the Africa region of the World Bank, uh, to the UK government on economic development policy, um, in, the, in its white paper, and most currently um, he is uh, assisting the UK government as they prepare for taking up the uh, leadership of the G8. Um, in addition, he writes popular uh, articles um, and has written for the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. So uh, his lifelong, I guess, passion for Africa began in the mid-1970s when he spent time in Tanzania, uh, a time when Africa looked a lot different than it did now. Um, and at the time, um, I guess, Africa, uh, Tanzania was going through the Ujamaa process, uh, then shortly interrupted by structural adjustment. And I expect he'll tell you more about these kind of things. Um, he, for an economist, it's unusual to be a best-selling author, uh, unfortunately, speaking as an economist. Um, but as you've noticed on the table outside, he has a whole series of best-selling books. The Bottom Billion, uh, which came out, I think, in 2007, and his 2010 book, The Plundered Planet. Um, and after the lecture, you'll be able to uh, have copies signed, if you would like. Um, Paul was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2008 birthday honours, so probably he got to meet the Queen at that time. I don't know. Did you, Paul? Um, he was listed uh, by Foreign Policy magazine in 2010-2011 to its list of top global thinkers. Um, so, just on a small basis, he, uh, the she going back to Sheffield, in case you've seen the film The Full Monty, perhaps, uh, anyway, both Paul and I were born in Sheffield, um, though to hear him speak, you, you wouldn't think that either he or I were from the same place, or probably not from Sheffield either. Um, and I guess his first experience in Africa was in Tanzania, and some years later, my first experience in Africa was in, also in Tanzania. Um, he and I never met in Sheffield. Uh, the first time we met was in Nairobi, uh, where he had been a long-standing advisor and important key figure in the um, African Economic Research Consortium, um, where I also um, did some work. So tonight's lecture, I'm sure we'll draw on his many years of experience in Africa and his detailed knowledge of the many African countries. Um, he he uh, is going to talk about resource issues and Africa's development. Um, one of the, t one of the uh, phrases that he coined is diamonds are a gorilla's best friend, which as you'll know has been then subsequently used by diamond marketing companies slightly changed. Uh, in any case, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome such a distinguished and knowledgeable uh, person to come and give tonight's Hagee Lecture. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sue, for those kind words. Uh, um, anybody who was hoping that uh, I would continue in the Sheffield tradition of the full Monty... Um, <laughs> is going to be disappointed. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for, for inviting me here. Um, it's nice to be back. I, I was here about four years ago for, for CG. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight um, is, uh, is the group of countries that I, I sort of call the, the bottom billion. Um, that's... Uh, a group of 60 or so mostly rather small countries, but all poor, that have, um, over the last 40 years, 
um, diverged from the rest of mankind. And if that divergence continued over the next 40 years, the world will be, will be facing a disaster of a, of a billion people plus at the bottom of the world economy, basically detached from it. So it's a vital matter that um, the history of the last 40 years isn't repeated. Um, and the, these countries, or most of them, as it happens, have an astonishing opportunity to catch up. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about tonight, is, is seizing that opportunity. And that opportunity arises um, because um, the, of the price boom in natural resources of the last few years. Um, and that price boom triggered a search, a global search for commodities. Um, there hadn't been much search for many years because prices have been low. And so just the last few years, there's been immense search. Uh, and that search has been concentrated in the poorest countries in the world. And there's very good reason for that, uh, and you're about to, to find out why. So this stage is conveniently divided into to sort of blocks of territory. So imagine that I'm standing on um, the block uh, of the, this is the typical square kilometer of the rich world, right? the OECD. Right? And we're gonna pick up the tile and look underneath, and I'm gonna tell you, underneath this tile, as of about 10 years ago, was $125,000 worth of natural subsoil assets. Oil, gas, gold, minerals, whatever. And now we'll move over to this equally sized. This is also a square kilometer, and it's the square kilometer of, of, the, of the typical um, square kilometer. Of the, uh, we'll take Africa as a concrete geographic entity. So that's the rich world, and this is the typical square kilometer of Africa. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look underneath the tile. Right? And to make it more interesting, instead of me telling you, you're going to tell me. Right? So that is $125,000. What's this? To make it manageable, I'm going to give you a choice. And you're going to vote. Right? Um, but you've got to vote. Right? Uh, so, this square of Africa, it could be less than $125,000 of the rich world, and it could be more. Uh, everybody who thinks that this square kilometer of Africa is less than the rich world, hands up now. And everybody who thinks that it's more, hands up now. And that's why you're going to remember this, there's about three people who got it right. Huh? Um, and the rest of you are not just wrong, you're very wrong. Um, the, the right answer is about $25,000. In other words, as of about 10 years ago, there was about a fifth as many natural resources per square kilometer in Africa as in the rich world. Now, I cheated because the figures I gave you were for known subsoil assets. I tried to find the figures for unknown subsoil assets, but I just couldn't find them. Right? Um, so what you've discovered is not that Africa's got less. If you think about it for a moment, that's most unlikely. These are huge chunks of territory. Right? I should say I've given this test to probably about 10,000 people by now, and you're running at about the average, right? about 98% <laughs> wrong. Um, 98% um, of the population votes less, 2%, 2, 2, 2, sorry, more, 2% votes less, and there's one out of 10,000 people who actually got the right answer, um, when straight away this guy said, um, but they must be the same, surely. They must be the same because they're two huge chunks of territory, the rich world and Africa, and so we're looking at random statistical processes which will produce averages which are just basically the same. Um, 
that was uh, Roger Myerson, who happens to have a Nobel Prize. So, you know, um, but he got the point, right? That you're looking at random geological processes. So we know that the averages are basically the same. The average will be a bit higher in Africa because the rich world's been digging the stuff out for 200 years, right? And there's still $125,000 left there, right? So Africa will be $125,000 plus, but we only found $25,000 as of 10 years ago. The resource extraction companies know that. That's why they're crawling all over Africa and the other countries of the bottom billion, right? looking for natural resources. And they're finding them. The last few years, there's been discovery after discovery after discovery. Right? Gas just discovered in Tanzania. Oil just discovered in Kenya, oil discovered in Ghana, so on and so forth. Biggest iron ore deposit in the world discovered in Guinea. Burkina Faso used to be a poor agricultural country, now it's a major gold producer. So natural resources, very valuable natural resources, which will total not the billions of dollars but the trillions. And this is Africa's own money. And so this is a huge opportunity for Africa to harness this money to finance its own transformation. So that's the opportunity we're discussing. Will Africa seize that opportunity? But if we look at the history of resource extraction in Africa and the other poor countries of the world, that history is not an encouraging prospect. It's a history <coughs> replete with, with three, three features. One, is, um, one is, is technical economics, and it's called Dutch disease, which is that you, you somehow mismanage the macroeconomy in such a way that you kill off all the, the tradable activities in the economy other than this resource. A good example of that would be Nigeria. Nigeria before the discovery of oil, was a major producer of cocoa and groundnuts. With the discovery of oil, both of those activities completely disappeared. And so the peasant farmers who'd been producing these things got their livelihoods wiped out at just the same time as prosperity was pouring out of the earth. So Dutch disease was a sort of economic manifestation of the problem. And then there are political manifestations of the problem. Plunder. Plunder taking two forms. The few expropriating what should belong to the many. And the present generation expropriating what should be benefiting the future generations. So Dutch disease, plunder, and then finally conflict. Where society fights over the resource and tears itself apart. So that's been the history of resource extraction. So we've got a huge upside, trillions of dollars which could be used to finance transformation, and a terrible reality of history. Far from capturing that upside, there's actually been a curse, and that's why in popular language, we now talk about the resource curse. So the challenge is to prevent history repeating itself. Not just in the modest sense of get back to zero, avoid the curse, but in the much more demanding sense of can we harness this opportunity for transformation. Hmm? But history didn't just happen. There were good reasons why that history of Dutch disease of plunder and conflict happen. There are powerful forces making that happen again. The default option is a repeat of history. And so the challenge is to, to learn from history instead of repeating it. Now, the, uh, the structure of the lecture is that uh, first we're going to take a long march through the economic decision chain to discover what decisions have to go right in order for these resources to be harnessed for prosperity. Right? And it's a chain of decisions. Until you know 
what economic decisions have to go right, you can't understand the political question, which is what politics makes those go right. But that's what we then turn to. So first we set out the economic decision chain, and then we turn to the question, what's the politics which produces that chain of decisions? Right? And then finally, I'm going to turn to you, Canada, and ask what can you do? Or more generally, what can the international community do? But as I will explain, um, Canada is not a metaphor for the international community. You turn, out, you turn out to be a pole position in the international community on this issue. So that's where we're going. And now we start the long march um, through the economic decision chain. And the, the first, it is a chain of decisions. The first link in that chain, you already know is broken. Right? And that's because the first link in the chain is discover your natural resources. The very fact that Africa had discovered so much less than the rich world per square kilometer tells you that process of discovery was broken. Right? The discovery of natural resources depends upon investment in search. And for various reasons, there was very little investment in search. Right? Search an investment in search is part of what's called the economics of information. It's been a very active area of economics the last 30, 40 years. One thing we've learned is that markets in information work very badly. This is not an area where the private market works well. For the simple reason that information is naturally a public good. And public goods are just not well supplied by private markets. If you just leave it to the private market, what you get is a long phase in which there's no search, and then somebody find, goes and finds something, and then you get a gold rush, as it were. Everybody crowds in. So you get a, a thousand years of too little search, and then a short period of overinvestment in search. So the market really doesn't handle information about geology very well. What's the alternative? Well, one alternative is to get public geological information. Um, and the, that's, that's an investment to be made by the government. Until very recently, the international institutions discouraged African governments from doing that. The World Bank just changed its position last year and now is actually providing funding for governments to get public geological information. There's another good reason why public geological information makes sense. Suppose that uh, I'm the government of, what should we call it, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which incidentally is neither democratic nor really a republic. Um, and I'm going to sell the prospecting rights to this piece of land. Right? Um, and all that we know about it, we don't know much about the geology at all, we just know that there's about a one in 10 chance of finding a billion dollars worth of something or other. Right? So nine chances in 10 there's nothing there and one chance that there's a billion dollars. What am I bid? Any bids? 100 million, thank you very much. Um, so somebody might go and look, that's certainly a possibility. Um, if I'm just selling the rights to go and look, and all we know is one in 10, and we're offered 100 million, um, Let's explore the 100 million bid, because it turns out it's not a very good idea. Um, the rest of you are actually right to keep quiet. Um, uh, because there's only two possibilities. You, you, you come, you pay me your 100 million, thank you very much, and then you drills your hole, and 
Nine chances in 10, there's nothing there, so bad luck, but I keep the money. Um, and then there's one chance in 10 that you found a billion. Yeah? So you've suddenly found a resource of a billion dollars. How much did you pay me? 100 million? What am I going to say? I'm the government. Do you think I'd say that? <laughs> if I don't say that, what do you think the opposition's going to say, right? Um, they're going to say, actually, you got more than 100 million, you got something under the table, didn't you? You know, everybody knew there was oil there. Um, now, and so I tear the contract up. Right? I say, you were, you were crooks, right? Offering only 100 million for this. Um, does that make you want to pay more than 100 million or less? Obviously less. Right? Does that make the problem go away or does it make it deeper? It actually accentuates. And so this is a case where there may be no market price for something that's only got a 1 in 10 chance of, uh, of being found. It just may not be worth bidding because the chances of, you being, of actually that contract being kept are so low. And that's another reason why getting public geological information so that you raise the probabilities uh, is a good idea. So much for the problem of discovering natural resources. Let's move to the next link in the decision chain, and that's taxing. You've got to try and, for the, for the society to benefit, the rents on the natural resources have to be captured by the society. That means the government has to tax the companies in some way. And that's difficult. Um, because um, the, uh, the, the rents on the natural resource are not themselves observed, directly observable. What you do observe is the reported taxable profits of the company. But taxable profits um, are a creation by the company, and there's a lot of room for, 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 for wiggling around here. There's a lot of room for what is called transfer pricing. I don't know if you've had the debate in Canada about what Starbucks is up to. Have you had that debate here? Um, it's been raging in Britain and America because Starbucks, bless it, doesn't pay any tax worth speaking of in either America or Britain. It's run virtually as a charity, it appears, um, not making any money at all for years. Um, but that's because they buy all their coffee from that great coffee producer, uh, Liechtenstein. Um, and Liechtenstein is a very little place, but apparently the hillsides are just covered in coffee trees um, where uh, Starbucks Liechtenstein Incorporated um, sells very high quality, because it's very expensive coffee, to Starbucks Britain and Starbucks America. Um, Starbucks Liechtenstein appears also to buy a lot of coffee, much more cheaply, from Africa. So all the profits of Starbucks operations accrue in a tax haven, which doesn't actually tax Starbucks. So that's um, transfer pricing as it applies to coffee sold in Britain and America. Um, the problem is far more severe with international companies operating, res extracting resources in Africa. Tax becomes very much a voluntary operation. I talked with the, uh, the tax authorities in Zambia recently, and they, they rather um, honestly said, you know, there aren't very many good accountants in Zambia, and they all work for the copper companies. Now, what's the job of a tax accountant in a Zambian copper company? Right? It's to minimize the tax bill. Right? Um, so, that's the, the nature of the, of the problem. And the, the, the answer is you better tax what you can observe uh, or build the capacity to observe what you're going to tax. Right? So, it's possible to get, um, to get high revenues from these companies but you need a tax system which is, which is designed so that it, it taxes the things which cannot be gained or which cannot be easily gained. 
Let's move on from discovery and tax to, um, I think the best way I can put this is, avoid the Niger Delta, uh, or a situation like the Niger Delta. That is where violence in the vicinity, in the neighborhood of the extraction process um, uh, flares up and continues. And in, in the Niger Delta, this has become a massive uh, problem. Um, how to avoid it? Um, the, um, what the Niger Delta is demanding is, um, is, is give us all the money. And that, I think, is not a good idea. Um, the, uh, and the reason is that that produces uh, a very unequal situation in which a small part of the country gets all the benefits from what is basically the lucky draw of having very valuable resources underneath you. Right? It seems to me much fairer if we can spread the benefits of natural resources over as large a population as possible, and in practical terms, that means all the citizens of the country. This is, you might have noticed, something that Canada doesn't do. Right? Most countries do. Most countries say natural resources and their benefits belong to all the citizens of the country. Right? And in Africa, that's a very important principle because localism can... If, once you go the local route, um, there's no limit to it. Yeah? There's a little country called Sao Tome Principe, which is two little islands... The, the Gulf of Guinea, and this lucky little country discovered oil. Um, it's not many people, about 100,000. Um, nearly all the people live in Sao Tome, right? Two islands, Sao Tome and Principe. Guess where the oil's discovered? Principe. Guess what the three people living in Principe say, right? <laughs> So you either have three billionaires or you spread it more equitably over the, the population. Um, of course, the people of the Delta, the people of any locality, need to have rights. And I suggest that the rights should be twofold. One is equal participation in the benefits to all citizens. And the other is credible and generous compensation for any environmental damage. And that depends upon good mechanisms for providing compensation. If we compare the oil spills in the Gulf of Guinea with the oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, there's both lots of oil spills. Right? The difference is the legal environment in which they occur. The Gulf, by, the, 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 the Gulf of Mexico spill by BP, the very first thing that BP did once that spill occurred was announced it was going to spend $500 million just on commissioning independent studies to discover who had suffered what losses. $500 million not to, not to, provide, not to compensate, just to get independent information. Okay. Why? Because given the American legal system, BP rapidly worked out the best they could possibly hope for was the truth. Right? If they couldn't provide the truth quickly, then the likely outcome was they'd be skinned alive by the American legal system. Right? No oil company in the Gulf of Guinea has ever announced they're going to spend millions of dollars finding out the truth because they've no incentive to find out the truth. There is no credible mechanism other than the violence of the local population to enforce compensation for environmental damage. So, we've discovered our natural assets by putting public geologic, getting public geological information. We've, we've, taxed, we've captured them for the society by having a, a well-designed tax system where we observe what we're going to tax. We've kept the local population um, on side, and now the revenues come through to the government, and what's the government going to do with those revenues? The fundamental choice with natural resources is that you're depleting a natural asset. You're running down an asset. And so it's important that you 
offset that by building up some other assets. And so you need to have a sensible savings rate out of that revenue. Um, and one of the big failings has been um, not to save, and indeed, um, sometimes to dissave, to use the, the, the credit worthiness that comes from natural resource revenues to go and gear up consumption by borrowing. So what you bequeath to the next generation is not assets, it's debts. That's the story of Nigeria until recently. Suppose you get that right and you save, then the next question is what, do you set, what assets do you acquire with your savings? And the poster child here is Norway. 50 developing countries have asked Norway for advice on what to do. And that's very worrying because what Norway does would be really foolish for poor countries to imitate. What Norway does is very sensible for Norway. What Norway does is uh, accumulate foreign financial assets, which means claims on capital in Brazil or claims on capital in China, that sort of thing. Why is it sensible for Norway to do that? Because it's already got more invested capital per worker than any other country on earth, literally. And so adding to the capital stock in Norway wouldn't produce very much. It's a better idea for Norway to, to buy capital in countries where the capital is going to be more productive. And now think of yourself as Sierra Leone. You've got some revenues coming from natural resources. Should you park that money, should you buy capital in Brazil with it? Of course not. You're at the other end of the spectrum from Norway. Instead of having more capital per worker than anywhere else, you've got less capital per worker than anywhere else. You're desperately short of investment. There's been practically no investment in your country for years. So you need to invest domestically, but there's a good reason why you're desperately short of capital, and that is typically these countries haven't got the capacity to invest well. They're short of capital, but they haven't got the capacity for good investment processes, either in the public sector or the private sector. Until about three years ago, the IMF, that was where their analysis stopped. And they had a word for this called absorptive capacity constraints. And so they concluded, OK, so the best thing is to do in Norway. Just put the money abroad. Okay. And now the IMF has woken up to the fact that really that is um, uh, a message of doom. Um, because unless these countries build that capacity to invest properly, they cannot ever develop. And so the vital thing is to recognize that there are indeed absorptive capacity constraints, but then to build the capacity to invest well. I call that investing in investing. Spending time and effort to build the capacity to invest well. So, we're nearly at the end of the economic decision chain. The, the, the final part of the chain is, remember that economic curse Dutch disease, where Nigeria, for example, wipes out its cocoa and groundnuts industries. How do you avoid that? Well, the answer is sequence. Um, Nigeria, like many countries, got the sequence wrong. They got these revenues, and they spent them on consumption. And if, you sp if the first thing you do with your revenue is spend on consumption, that's what generates Dutch disease. The spending drives up prices causes inflation in the non in what economists call the non-tradable sector, and that makes the tradable sector uncompetitive. So how do you avoid that? You don't start by spending the revenues on consumption. The right sequence is first to do that investing in investing, to build the capacity to invest well. Once you've built the capacity to invest well, then 
You use the revenues to invest within the economy. You build the capacity of the economy to, to produce. As you've done that, you've increased the supply side of the economy. And having increased the supply of goods, you can then safely increase the demand for goods. You can start to consume. And so it's a sequence first, build the capacity to invest, then do the investment, and only then let consumption rise. As long as you do that sequence, you don't end up with Dutch disease. As an illustration of that, Indonesia, which more or less followed that right sequence, um, broke in. The, the, the Indonesia discovered oil at just the same time as Nigeria. Remember, the Nigerian cocoa industry got destroyed. What actually happened was that the Nigerian cocoa industry moved lock, stock, and barrel to Indonesia. So one oil economy destroyed its cocoa industry, and another oil economy built a cocoa industry. So Dutch disease is not inevitable. So much for the economic decision chain. And now let's turn to the question of what politics produces those good economic decisions. And there are two features of, those, of that decision chain that should strike you politically. One is it's a long chain of decisions taken by a lot of different people. And so it's not a matter of just get a good president. It's a lot of different people have got to take those decisions. And the second feature is that it's not just one set of decisions once. The process of extracting and depleting natural assets may take a generation. That's the typical lifetime we're looking for in, in these, these processes. And so this, the, those, those good decisions have got to be taken repeatedly for a generation. So a lot of different people and the same decision taken correctly again and again. So how, what is the politics which supports that? And it's not just get a wise president. I'm going to suggest that there's a political tripod that produces good decisions. And the tripod, the first leg in the tripod is is rules, rules for economic decisions. Um, to give you an example of a, an African country which has recently adopted a good economic rule, last year Ghana put into its constitution the rule that 30% thir of all oil revenues should be saved. And that's a sensible rule that is specific to a resource-rich country. One thing that, in fact, should strike you is that the decision chain facing resource-rich countries is unique to them. Just taking the, the standard OECD rulebook of good economic policy misses, misses completely all these issues. So the resource-rich countries are distinctive. They're facing different economic challenges. So, Ghana discovers oil in 2007. Um, the first three or four years, it makes big mistakes, big mistakes. It goes out and borrows money, spends it much too fast and badly. And then 2011, it pulls back. The society has learned enough to say, we don't want to do it that way. Let's get a, get a rule in place. Yeah? Now, rules... Um, realistically, their effect is to guide decisions, not to force decisions. The word rule seems to imply that you've no choice but to follow it, but as I'll show in a moment, um, rules uh, are in fact generally optional. Um, but having a rule at least gives you guidance when you come to a decision. The same decision has to be taken year after year. And if you've got a rule, at least you know whether you're following it or not. If there's no rule, 
Everybody's making up the decision afresh each time. So rules are the first leg in, the, in this political tripod. The second leg is institutions. Institutions are the, the teams of people who implement the decisions specified in the rules. So it's rules plus institutions. And again, the institutions that resource-rich countries will need are distinctive. Their institutions, their economic institutions, won't look like the institutions that a typical developed country has because they're resource-rich and most developed countries are not. Canada's an exception. So rules and institutions. But rules and institutions are not enough. Um, because rules can be ignored and institutions can be ignored. They can just be words on paper and little groups of people who are ignored. And here's the example um, to show that rules and institutions are not enough. Um, you might have heard of the euro. Right? The euro, bless it, is, um, is two fiscal rules and one institution, European Central Bank. Two rules, one institution, and 17 European governments. Right? And they've had 11 years when these rules have applied. So there's the two rules, there's the one institution, 17 governments, 11 years. How many of those 17 governments have followed the, those two rules for 11 years? Any bids? Oh, no, no, that's much too... One. Anybody want to say which one? No, no, not Germany. No, 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 no. They, they don't practice what they preach. Um, <laughs> Finland, Finland. That, that's why the Finns... Have you heard of the true Finns party? This is why the Finns are so hopping mad, right? They're the only ones who follow the rules, right? So... You can have the rules and you can have the institutions. That's not enough. Not enough even in the fine, upstanding countries of Europe, right? right? Why? Because the third leg of the tripod was missing. The third leg is a critical mass of citizens who understand the issues well enough to support the rules and to support the institutions. And the euro just didn't build that critical mass of citizens. Yeah. You look at the, you know, the Greeks on the streets, they're not demanding that the Greek government follow the two fiscal rules. Yeah. Far from it. Yeah. So the challenge for um, resource-rich countries is not just to build the rules and to put in place institutions, but to create a critical mass of citizens who understand why the issues are important and therefore defend them. Um, how can that be done? Not by giving a lot of economics lectures, right? But, but it is, the, the core ideas here are actually very simple and they can be summed up um, in the concept of good stewardship. Um, a lot of uh, Africa has big, it's very much a, a religious um, societies. And, uh, and the concept of good stewardship is, fam is, is familiar to, uh, to, to religion. Um, think, for example, of the, uh, uh, the, the Gospel of, of St. Luke and the parable of the talents, where the, the rich man leaves talents with his stewards, goes away, comes back, says, what have you done? And the stewards that are praised are the ones that have actually saved and invested the talents and show that they've sort of fructified those talents. And so the, the concept of good stewardship of natural assets, that if you run the stuff down, you better have something to show for your children, that's something which any family in Africa can understand. So building that critical mass 
is, is, is entirely possible, but it does require the government to be proactive in its communications. Right? It has to go out and explain to people that this is what's happening. And if it doesn't do that, there's a disastrous default option. The wrong narrative takes hold. Um, I was just in Tanzania last month, and uh, Tanzania has just discovered gas. Um, it's off the sh offshore from a region called Matwara, which is very poor in South Tanzania. And the, uh, the commissioner for Matwara uh, was a very worried man. Um, so gas had been discovered offshore. What he reported was the young people in Matwara are now going around refusing to work, saying, we don't need to work anymore. We're all rich. Yeah. Same thing happened with the discovery of oil in Kenya. I discovered the oil in March. The announcement went out. I saw the finance minister in April. But how are things going? He said, it's a nightmare. The whole public sector has already demanded a big wage rise. No oil revenues will come for years, but people get it into their heads that they're suddenly all shakes, you know? So the default option is just that, the, the sense we're all rich, we don't need to work anymore. So the default option has to be countered by a, a, the government being proactive in its communications and seeding this idea, this narrative of good stewardship that the huge opportunity presented to the present generation comes with a big responsibility to use the revenues well. Um, finally, let me turn to the, uh, from the domestic politics to the question of what the international community can do. And, um, and the first, the starting point is to recognize that these are predominantly domestic political struggles. This is not our struggle, it's their struggle. But it's a struggle that really matters for the poorest people on earth. Just remember what the stakes are here. This is their opportunity decisively to transform themselves out of poverty. But if history repeats itself, that won't happen. So they, that's, that's what's at stake. In all these societies, there are brave people struggling to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. And history doesn't have to repeat itself. Let's try another question. What's the best-run economy in Europe today? A big one. <laughs> <laughs> and you are allowed to say Germany this time. Um, the interesting question is not what's the best run economy in Europe today, it's obviously Germany. The question is why is it the best run economy in Europe? And the answer is because it used to be the worst. If you go back to the first half of the 20th century, Germany was a disaster. It was the only major European society to go into hyperinflation, Fascism, defeat in two world wars. This, this was the nightmare society of Europe. And Germans came out of that with a burning sense of never again. That's where Africa is now, this burning sense of never again. Of course, it's never again to a quite a different experience. It's never again to plunder in Africa. But the Germans harnessed that sense of never again and did those three things, rules, they were the first country in Europe to put in fiscal rules. Institutions, if you want to avoid hyperinflation, you need an independent central bank. They were the first country in Europe to create one. Rules and institutions. But we know rules and institutions are not enough. The key step in Germany was to build a critical mass of citizens who understood the past well enough to understand why the rules and the institutions were important and therefore have defended them ever since. Right? So it's not inevitable that you repeat a dysfunctional history. You really can learn from it. 
In Germany, that dysfunctional history actually became an investment. It became, a valu became valuable to have a dysfunctional history so that you actually flip from being the worst managed to the best managed. So that's what's at stake. What can we as outsiders do to help those internal struggles. Um, and there are, there are going to be three things that we can do. Um, and the first is to help in the struggle for transparency in resource revenues. Without transparency in resource revenues, plunder is almost inevitable. The few expropriating what should belong to the many. Transparency doesn't guarantee success along the decision chain. Far from it. Right? It's a long and complex decision chain. But without transparency, you pretty well guarantee failure. Right? Transparency um, comes from reporting information and the, the first initiative, in, the international initiative on that was launched 10 years ago called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And that is now um, adopted by 37 governments. Uh, and it has made some difference. But the problem with the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, it's, it's better than nothing. It's had its successes, but it's a voluntary system and it's at the moment quite limited. The board of the EITI is considering in May extending the reach of transparency so it will become more useful. Um, and there's uh, also a possibility of getting more countries to, to sign up. Last year, America signed up to the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Somewhat astonishingly, Britain, which launched it, hasn't yet signed up to it. It's just debating whether to now. Right? Um, Canada hasn't signed yet. Um, so much for transparency through voluntarism. Voluntarism takes you so far, but the next step is to enshrine transparency as a legal requirement. Of, of resource extraction companies. And America led the way there with the Cardin-Lugar Amendment to the Finance Act. Um, and so, as of last year, Ameri all resource extraction companies listed on American stock markets have to report in a lot of detail their payments to governments, not just their payments over revenues, but their payments in how they win contracts. And that's enormously important in reducing the capacity of companies to bribe their way into, dis into contracts which are very disadvantageous for governments. So America's done it. We know it's effective because American oil companies um, are mounting a legal challenge to try and slow the whole thing down. And they're doing that because they know that it'll disadvantage them against other companies. Right? So we know it's the right thing to do. Right? But it needs to go global. Well, it is. Next month, the European Parliament is expected to pass the same legislation covering all the European stock exchanges. So America, tick. Europe, tick. Canada happens to be home to the most important stock markets in the world for the second line resource extraction companies. And it's the second line, the second tier resource extraction companies that are by far the most important in the battle for transparency. If you look at the global rankings of corporate transparency, at the very top, the, the most transparent companies in the world are the big resource extraction companies. Why? Because they've been so beaten up over the years by the NGOs that they've no choice 
Right? They're scrutinized to death, and so they're very transparent. So the best resource extraction companies, the really big ones, are completely transparent. But that same industry has a very long tail. And what's developed over the last few years is that the companies that are not required to be transparent go in with the competitive advantage of winning the contracts by hook or by crook, and probably by crook, and then they sell the rights to the big companies, whose hands are then completely clean. So that's what's happening at the moment. And that can only be stopped here. Because you, in Toronto and Vancouver, have the two main global centers for financing these companies. The, you have the stock exchanges on which these companies are listed. So, America's passed this legislation, Europe is about to pass it. If you pass it, that makes a really big difference. And if you don't pass it, you blow a hole in the whole transparency process. Voluntarism is starting to, to, meet, to meet the limits of, of the possible. And so, legislation is, is essential. So, is Canada going to find itself, as of next month, in pole position? Um, and uh, and I, this is one of the reasons why I was keen to, to give this, this talk, because um, with modern technology of Twitter and such like, um, it's, it's young people like you that can actually make a message go viral. Right? This has got to be a debate that Canada has to have and come out on the right side of history right? and think what is at stake. So transparency in the revenues, transparency in all the payments, including how you get contracts. Um, and then, uh, oh, yes, and then finally, um, transparency in um, that tries to close down the money laundering. And at the moment, um, what happens when plunder occurs is crooks bribe government officials, big money meets poor officials, and so they succumb to corruption. They part with rights for resource extraction, for a song, which are very valuable. They are then given money, and what do they do with that money? They have to launder it. Money laundering happens not in Africa, but in the big financial centers. The, the, probably the biggest single financial center for money laundering is London, where lawyers set up shell companies. The shell companies then open bank accounts and the true owner of the company and the bank account, was called the beneficial owner, cannot be traced. Yeah. And that is the present um, disgraceful reality. There was an extraordinary randomized experiment done last year um, by an Australian university which sent out 4,000 emails to lawyers around the world asking them to set up a company and in the email was planted a lot of evidence that this was probably rather suspect. Right? One of the things that was randomly sent out was the additional information that if you, can, if you can set up this company without doing the usual checks, preserving confidentiality, we'll pay you more. 40% of those emails ended up with agreement by the lawyers to set up such companies. 40%. So, at the moment, money laundering is really easy. And that, too, has to be closed. That loophole has to be closed. And that requires cooperation between the major financial centers. Um, the Canadian government is trying to tighten up, as part of a coordinated process, 
there's a thing called the Financial Action Task Force, which is trying to coordinate um, uh, the, the tightening of the rules on confidentiality so that it becomes harder to preserve confidentiality. And incredibly, the Canadian Bar Association is at the moment mounting a legal challenge to the Canadian government to preserve its human right to conceal. Right? Its human right to facilitate money laundering. Right? So, um, this is an appeal. The, the way we can stop all this right, is if young people spread that message around and start to talk to your parents and your uncles and your aunts and what have you who are these lawyers and say, what on earth are you doing? Right? I learned of this fact yesterday from the British Law Society, which is Britain's club of lawyers, and even that club was incredulous that the Canadian Bar Association was doing this. Right? So um, you don't have to be very radical to believe that uh, the, the Canadian Bar Association is a bit out of line here. So we've done the, uh, the long march through the economic decision chain. We've looked at the political approach of rules, institutions, and building a critical mass of informed citizens. And finally, we've looked at what we as, as outsiders can do. Um, as, a, as a Briton, the stuff that Britain can do, Britain is actually the president of the next G8 process, and so there's a good hope that it will use that as an opportunity to try and shape an agenda of cleaning up, of trying to put our own house in order for once. But finally, I am excited to be here because Canada really matters on this issue. You are the OECD G8 country which is made a success of natural resources. Right? You are rich thanks to successful management of natural resources. Share that experience, the pole position in helping in this struggle which will determine the fate of a billion poor people. Thanks very much. to just take this opportunity to thank Professor Paul Collier for a fascinating talk. If that doesn't help bring different fields of inquiry together, I'm not sure what does. A little bit of politics, a lot of economics, calls for engaged citizens and uh, attention to the local processes in Canada was just fascinating. You made the long march on the economic decision chain a little bit pleasant even for those of us wearing high heels. <laughs> so uh, on behalf of uh, the Faculty Association and the committee and the university, I'd like to thank you one more time for a fascinating talk.